So now, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to invite our panelists for the panel discussion. And uh, immediately we call on them. The citation will be going on at the same time. All right. First on my list, ladies and gentlemen, is the managing director, Nigerian branch in, of Nigeria in, branch international in person of Dayo Ademola. Ladies and gentlemen, can we celebrate him, please, as he comes forward? Or she comes forward, rather. Dayo Ademola. Dayo Ademola is the managing director, Nigeria, for Branch International, a San Francisco-based fintech operating in Nigeria, Kenya, Tanzania, and India. She holds a bachelor's degree in international business and economics from Temple University, USA, and a global executive MBA from Intiad Business School in France. She is a senior financial services and technology professional with over 15 years of experience in innovation, business strategy, customer segmentation, strategic marketing, product positioning, product development, and business performance management across software, telecoms, and financial services industries. Dio is passionate about leveraging technology and capital to deepen access to financial services and wealth for Africans at all levels. Her personal goal is to help build successful and profitable business models that help solve this challenge at scale. She has held roles at Enhancing Financial Innovation and Access, Athena, Union Bank, Main One, Rosetta Stone, and others. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dayo Ademola. All right, thank you so much, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. All right, also joining us virtually, ladies and gentlemen, is the Executive Director, Bank of Industry, in person of Toyin Adeniji. Can we celebrate her, ladies and gentlemen? Toyin Adeniji. Toyin Adeniji is the Executive Director, Microenterprises of the Bank of Industry. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering from the University of Lagos and a Master of Business Administration from the Harvard Graduate School of Business. Her experience in the financial industry spans various areas. She has acquired considerable experience at the International Finance Corporation as Investment Officer in the Syndications and International Securities and Global Mining Departments, Head Women in Business, and Principal Operations Officer, SME Development. Mrs. Adenichi also functioned as the managing director of Susu Microfinance Bank Limited, an institution licensed by the Central Bank of Nigeria to provide a broad range of financial services to micro entrepreneurs and the unbanked market. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Toy Adeniji. All right, thank you so much. You'll be joining us virtually. All right, also, we want to call on um, the Chief Operating Officer, Development Bank of Nigeria, in person of Bonaventure Okaimo. Let's celebrate them, ladies and gentlemen. Bonaventure Kaimo. Bonaventure Kaimo is the current Chief Operating Officer of Development Bank of Nigeria, PLC. He holds an LLB from University of Benin, Nigeria, an MBA in Financial Management, and a Chartered Banker MBA from the Federal University of Technology Aware in Nigeria and Bangor University, Great Britain, respectively. He is a Chartered Banker and a member of the Chartered Bankers Institute UK, with over 25 years banking experience spread across international banks in Nigeria. His vast industry experience includes branch operations, branch management, leadership roles in retail and MSME banking, development finance, institutional banking, information technology, and strategic operations service delivery. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Bonaventure Kaimo. All right, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Also, we are privileged to have the Executive Director, Business Development Assets Bank, in person of Chizoba Okoli. Chizoma Okoli, can we celebrate our ladies and gentlemen? Mrs. Chizoma Okoli. Mrs. Chizoma Okoli is the Executive Director of Business Banking Division at Access Bank PLC. She is a law graduate from the University of Benin and holds an MBA from Warwick Business School, Coventry, UK. She commenced her banking career as an executive trainee in the operations unit at Diamond Bank and served in various capacities in the bank until her appointment as an executive director in Diamond Bank. Mrs. Okoli joined the board of Access Bank PLC in March 2019. Following the merger with the former Diamond Bank, she has attended various courses in Nigeria and abroad, including Advanced Management Program of Wharton Executive Education, University of Pennsylvania, and the Senior Management Program of the Lagos Business School. She is also an honorary member of the Chartered Institute of Bankers of Nigeria. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mrs. Chizoma Okoli. All right, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. We are also privileged to have in our midst the Senior Financial Sector Specialist 
with the World Bank. Ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together as we welcome Ahmed Rostum. Ahmed Rostom. Dr. Ahmed Rostom is a senior financial specialist at the World Bank's Finance, Competitiveness and Innovation Global Practice, Central and West Africa region. He holds an MSc in Economics and Social Policy Analysis from the University of York, United Kingdom, and a PhD in Economics at George Washington University in the United States. He has experience in leading policy-based and investment operations in Africa and Southeast Asia region, and has contributed to several operations in Europe, Central Asia, Middle East, and North Africa region. He has also led and contributed to several financial and monetary sector assessment assignments. Dr. Rostum's area of expertise includes macrofinance linkages, effectiveness of monetary policies, long-term finance, financial inclusion, and financial infrastructure in client countries. His prior experience spans many positions with government, central bank, and banking in Egypt. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ahmed Rostum. Let's celebrate him, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. Also, we want to call on the head of Green and Digital Economy EU delegation to Nigeria and ECOWAS in person of Inga Stefanowit. Let's celebrate her, ladies and gentlemen. Inga Stefanowit. Inga Stefanowit is the head of section Green and Digital Economy at the EU delegation to Nigeria and ECOWAS. She studied at the University of Warsaw, Poland. She has spent the last three to five years working at the EU delegation to Nigeria and ECOWAS in Abuja. Prior to her being head of Section Green and Digital Economy, she was the acting head of Economic Cooperation and Energy Sector. She currently heads the Green and Digital Economy operations in Nigeria while focusing on the priorities of the EU Green Deal. Her background in economic policy, research and advice is in range of international and development finance institutions. She comes from Poland. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Inga Stefanowit. Let's celebrate our ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, at this juncture, I'll be stepping aside and I'll call on our moderator for the day in person of Sophie Dong, the Financial Sector Specialist, World Bank. Can we celebrate our ladies and gentlemen as she comes forward to moderate this session? All right, um, you can kindly take the mask off, please, so our viewers online can get to see our faces. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for, so much for joining. So we will now start our panel discussion. I know it will be hard to uh, talk about uh, trains associated to access to for MSMEs uh, without discussing the means and instruments that different uh, institutions are using to address some of these constraints. So we have an amazing panel today uh, just to do that. Uh, so we're gonna cover some territory here uh, we're going to touch on issues regarding the current state of MSME finance uh, uh, in Nigeria. Uh, we're going to talk about impact of COVID on the operations modality of the different institutions. We're probably also going to talk about, you know, what are the really needs of these MSMEs and how are the different key players in the market uh, are doing to address these needs. Um, we would also like to hear, for example, what are the uh, key constraints these players are facing on the supply side, as well as the, the role of the development partners. Um, so let's start with you, Ahmed. Uh, could you give us an overview on the lay of land on the MSME finance in Nigeria? Can I have my slides on, please? So I'll... I'll be a bit live, so I'll not feeling the jet lag. I'll step down because we'll have some slides to share with you as we lay the land for, for the discussions today. And um, as also like to give a bit of a visualization to the, a lot of uh, the good introductions that we had uh, through our uh, keynote addresses. So I really appreciate them. So let me just start also by thanking all of you for being here with us today. It's a privilege. I mean, if I've been asked two years ago that I'll have uh, an in-person event where we can engage with our counterparts and partners in the live room, I would have highly doubted it. So I'm, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be back here and to be with all of you here today. I also appreciate all my colleagues at the whole bank who's with us today and also helped tirelessly to put this together and our partnership with BBN 
who made this happen. Um, uh, again, for whoever is online, we appreciate their time. Uh, I guess we've got uh, interest from 2,500 uh, participants to be there. We have almost 150 participants online with us now, but the uh, PowerPoint slides and the, and the proceedings will, will be shared with whoever has registered and showed interest in the event. So next, please. Um, I, I think we've heard um, a lot and we've heard uh, what I'm calling them the common factors that makes it only, uh, that makes sense for MSMEs to be at the heart of economic recovery. I've heard it from our keynote panelists, from our acting country director, and also uh, from um, uh, director, Dr. Zachary, and uh, from Mr. Tony, Dr. Tony. So uh, I guess that with what uh, MSMEs are offering the Nigerian economy, being at the core of job creation, being uh, a, a considerate proportion of the economic activity, and being also as numerous as more than 42 or almost 42 million enterprises serving the Nigerian economy, uh, it's it's uh, only makes sense to be at the heart of policy consideration, and that's the heart. That's part of why we're here today. And also, as we heard from uh, Ms. Kathy Wimpet, uh, the the financial deepening and inclusion is at the heart of the uh, uh, World Bank's country partnership framework, where we're looking at uh, through financing engagements and through technical assistance and through advisory work and um, also our policy dialogue that we're having today to look into how to strengthen uh, that critical segment of the economy. So next, please. So knowing that, the, and again, I will, we'll have the slides. I mean, there's a bit of challenge with the uh, resolution, but we'll have them shared with colleagues who have registered for that. But um, just uh, a bit of the visualization of several of the issues and constraints that we've heard today. Um, now that the MSNEs are the firepower for inclusive recovery or for resilient recovery, um, is the financial sector. And I'm also I'm from the finance profession, so I'm, I'm to be part of those who will be asked. Uh, and addressed by that question that I'm personally asking for all of us today. Are we in the financial sector space doing fairness to MSMEs when it comes to a big country like Nigeria? We've heard a lot, we've heard from our panelists today, but let me show you how that is benchmarked when Nigeria, the largest economy in Africa has benchmarked against its aspirational peers. So what we're seeing is that, and I hope that colleagues can see it then, what we're seeing here is that compared to the, its aspirational peers, there are relatively fewer firms in Nigeria compared to other countries that are able to access formal financial services. It's not undermining the effort that's being done. It's just telling us, all of us in the room here, and all of us that are engaged in this policy area, that more needs to be done. And that's part of what the discussion here today is about. Um, if we're looking at in terms, but nevertheless, um, um, in the efforts in the financial development space in Nigeria and financial inclusion in Nigeria, is also reflected in the past decade with the banking penetration for the adult population, uh, jumping from uh, almost 30% to 45%. And, and that, uh, that growth rate, despite that it's remarkable in terms of uh, um, the decade, in terms of a large country like Nigeria, but the aspirations are much higher. 45% for Nigeria is relatively low and more needs to be done when it comes to banking the adult population and, and, and boosting financial deepening and financial inclusion. So in terms of financial deepening and the credit to the private sector is one of the key elements through which we monitor financial deepening. So again, um, the credit to private sector as a percent of GDP as it relates to the Nigerian economy is still, um, I would say, humble compared to other aspirational peers, which means that we need to do more when it comes to getting the private banks and the commercial banks to engage more in financing for commercial activities in Nigeria. Next, please. So at time of crisis, I guess the policy, the, the core and the center of policy is about sectors that can be resilient, can weather shocks, and can put the economy on the route for sustainable recovery. The history has told us that Nigeria with the uh, oil collapse uh, in 2014, that agriculture was the key sector and the key vehicle for recovery that supported Nigeria in the past. But is that so now when we look at the sectoral credit to private sector? in Nigeria is are the banks voting confidence to that sector, which was the core for resilient recovery. And now that we are on the doors and looking into policy options for resilient recovery in the country, um, I guess what we're seeing in the bar graph is telling us something different. It's telling us that the banks are voting more confidence to the services sector in Nigeria. So the risk appetite for that sector is, is, is fairly acceptable. Um, the oil and gas sector is certainly undeniable. It's, it's a considerate portion of um, the credit to, to the private sector in Nigeria. So the oil and gas sector is, uh, so the banking sector is relatively exposed uh, with a considerable almost 18 to 20% of the risk assets are in that sector. Uh, if we're talking, if we're having this discussion a year ago with the collapse in oil prices would have been a risk. Luckily it didn't materialize, now it's on the upside. 
So we hope that this upside will not translate into more crowding out of other productive sectors. I mean, it's a productive sector, it's a critical sector, but it doesn't mean we undermine other productive sectors that embrace diversification of the economy. And how to risk that would be subject of a discussion today. I don't want to rush into conclusions here. We're having perspectives. I want to listen to perspectives from our colleague panelists here. So nevertheless, back to the agriculture story, the agriculture portion of the agriculture share of private credit is really humble. Central bank stepped in, and we have several interventions, including the anchor borrower program. And if we look um, that the anchor borrower program disbursements have really exponentially grew during the past two years. And if we compare that to the percentage of private credit to the agriculture sector, it's almost 90%, which means 90% of the very humble portion of access to finance of agriculture is coming from that particular scheme. And nevertheless, um, the growth has been a bit steady, but then um, whether this can be an opportunity for private banks to come in, I guess we all know that the way the uh, ABP is priced is quite concessionary. So getting the, uh, the banks in a commercial space to offer risk adjusted pricing for agriculture lending would be a bit challenging. So that's something certainly that we need to be cognizant of and thinking about how to engage more and how to look sustainable in the medium term to finance the agriculture sector that is a core for resilience for Nigeria against, against unforeseen shocks and idiosyncratic shocks. So we can go next, please. I wasn't planning to speak much, but it's that resolution that's making me a bit more detailed. All right, so with, um, so with the recent, with the recent uh, twin shock uh, that has impacted the Nigerian economy, and again, after the first round of the panels, I'm happy that our lead economist, Marco Hernandez, will share some perspectives as well. So after the twin shock that has hit the Nigerian economy, being the COVID-19 and the earlier collapse on oil prices a couple of years back, the central bank stepped in with serious measures. They were meant to avert the risks um, that were impacting and influencing the financial sector, including uh, uh, enacting loan forbearance, reduce the interest rates on its own schemes, and it also has stepped up the implementation and enactment of the loan to deposit ratio. Uh, nevertheless, uh, several reductions in the policy rates um, uh, since 2020, uh, from 13.5 almost to 11.5, and I guess this 11.5 remains on, on hold or remains in action until early last week. Um, this is a sense, of, a sense of an accommodating monetary policy, um, and, and certainly the way this is looked at, and we'll be sharing a bit of more sophisticated slides just to show how this is reflecting on uh, further on intermediation that's critical. And, and the way we look at it is that financial intermediation broadly is how the banks operate. But then nevertheless, we look from the financial intermediation perspective into the MSMEs, which is the core of the discussion today. So we'll go next. Would that be enough in order to encourage banks to take more risks in such an uncertain environment? I guess more institutional efforts are required to encourage risk-taking decisions by financial intermediaries. And by that, we mean deepening the informational base. And my colleague Obong from IFC was here, I guess doing more on deepening the informational base and the credit infrastructure to, to support credit, credit risk behavior or credit risk-taking behavior is really critical. And as part of what we need to see in terms of availing information to banks about borrowers so that they can take informed decisions. Um, loan foreclosure, uh, Assets repossession, resale uh, guidelines need to be also revisited to ensure that the banks have the assurance that they're able to access collateral upon need and to have this assurance and to have this ease of credit decisions as well as part of what might be uh, considered as we move forward. We need to register the movable collaterals and a, a robust registry for movable collaterals that are also uh, part of what can be considered as. Um, Possible, possible collaterals to bank lending is really critical as, as, as uh, part of what we're looking at while creating this enabling environment for intermediation. I'll try to be very brief, so we move next. All right, so where did that take us? Briefly, so that is the institutional ecosystem now moving into the macro finance space. So in very quick facts, so that I lay the grounds for my colleagues to come in, what we're seeing and what the figures are and the facts are telling us is that initially, the government that is growing, but nevertheless, CBN's share of financing that debt is also growing. In contendum, no, please back. So strong manifest. In contendum, the, the interest rate on, on government securities are dropping, and nevertheless, strong enactment of the CRR of the out of credit CRR also 
is implicated. So this whole mix is implicating what we can call the plumbing of liquidity and credit intimidation in the financial sector. So there is more financial repression. There is a bit of uh, more uh, enactment of the CRRs and that inhibits banks' ability to intermediate funds. We move next. Part of the uh, part of the bigger picture also is the microfinance space. So in the microfinance space, it's undeniable that we have pressures on the exchange rate. And um, as I mentioned, the, the interest rates are slipping, but nevertheless, inflation is on the rise. So we have real negative interest rates. While that is favorable to borrowers, but then to lenders, this is a bit of a challenge. And then take us to another fact that the real effective exchange rate of Nigeria is slipping. And that rings a bell that the competitiveness of the Nigerian economy is an issue that policy is a policy issue that needs to be considered and underlined. You move next, please. So while I wrap up, where is that taking us? It's taking us to a couple of facts that are now materializing that we need to be cognizant of while we consider more support to the MSMEs uh, through the banking sector. Number one is that the market efficiency is being challenged. And by that, I measured that. Uh, we measured that usually in the banking industry by the spread between the deposit rate. And here I'm taking the proxy of the maximum lending rate because MSMEs are usually tagged as highly risk assets. So, so they're always tagged with the ceiling of, entry of lending rates when it comes to intermediation. So that wedge between the deposit rates and the highest uh, 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 risky, risky asset class lending rates is quite remarkable. But nevertheless, let me look at the, the deposit lending spreads are also quite remarkable in Nigeria with this bottom right graph with the, with the, red, with the red line. It's showing us that the, the borrowing lending spreads are quite high in Nigeria compared to other countries. And it's a signal that we need to look into the efficiency of financial intimidation as part of these interventions, de-risking and looking at reliable cost of financing um, while, while we push more towards MSME financing. So, in, in reflection of this, the credit is rebounding. So credit to the private sector is rebounding, but I would, so I would call this a sluggish rebound because still, I mean, we didn't even reach the pre-COVID levels yet. So that is telling us that, that it's an association between the economic recovery and credit, and credit growth. It's telling us that we're still not fully yet on the full recovery mode, we did not fully shift gears. Finally, what we're looking at is the, um, the banking sector's performance is uh, witnessing some red flags. This is certainly expected as, as we're coming out of a twin shock and we're seeing a third shock in place, um, but it's only telling us that maybe there is more cushioning taking place, more provisioning, more accounting for the rainy days. Uh, but as we move, again, as we move forward, this is something that can be uh, and needs to be under consideration for policy when we look at the banking sector performance. So as I wrap up, um, I think as some food for thought, next please. Some food for thought as I think needing to align the priorities between the monetary and financial sector policies is really critical. Um, strengthening the institutional aspects that I mentioned about deepening the informational base and, uh, and the collateral management issues, again, also is something that we need to put on the table and think about as we discussed today. And also enhancing the role of the banks and MSMEs looking at possible financial innovations. We're happy to hear and listen. I didn't want to impose uh, any ideas for now, but happy to listen more. And before I wrap up as next, um, I'd like to uh, encourage you to please visit the Nigeria Development Update webpage for the November, for the November issue. We have a detailed note that highlights our analysis. Most of that's still relevant. Maybe we'll need to augment that because of the Ukraine crisis. But then with that, I thank you so much. I apologize if I stretched a bit, but I guess it's the resolution that didn't help me give the correct pressure. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ahmed, for the very comprehensive presentation. Uh, indeed, you've mentioned uh, many things that are very relevant to, uh, to the financial sector, such as the efficiency of the financial intermediation, as well as uh, some of the efforts that are needed to build an ecosystem. Uh, some of the things you've mentioned, like credit information, the collateral management, loan forbearance. Uh, I'd love to come back to you at some point to discuss more and also to learn more on which institutions are doing what. Uh, but now let's, uh, uh, let's, uh, let's uh, turn to Bona. <laughs> Bona, so the Development Bank of Nigeria has the mandate of alleviating um, constraints on financial access for MSMEs by leveraging, uh, you know, wholesale lending and also partial credit guarantees. But as far as I know, the DBN has only uh, started operating a few years ago before the COVID hit the ground. So how did the COVID impact the MSME finance in Nigeria? And how big is the impact from DBN's perspective? Thank you very much, uh, Sophie. That's a very good question. And um, 
for us at TBN, you again realize the fact that the MSMEs, we all know that their mode of operations is largely traditional and they require a lot more of physical contact. So definitely there's no need to even overburden the, the fact that they suffered a lot during the pandemic. It affected their cash flows, their revenues. And then this is a, a, a segment where the financial system considered to be very high risk. They were not obtaining financing before. So just think about it. They are not able to generate enough revenues anymore. Cash flows are now impacted. Obviously, the financial system no longer find them attractive. They were not attractive before anyways. So we are now at a situation, we are now at a crossroad at DBN. We have a mandate to alleviate this stress, let me put it that way, that the MSMEs are facing in Nigeria. So what then do we do? So we had to come in, you know, apart from that, the, the specific problem they were facing, think about the effect of the inflation that was going up and all of that, that affected quite a lot of things as well. Um, so we had to do something. We first, what we did was, we supported the federal government of Nigeria um, in combating the, 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 the crisis. We made a contribution to the COVID fund. We contributed about a um, hundred million naira. Um, additionally, we looked specifically at the problems that they were facing since their cash flows were now impacted. We, in conjunction with our participating financial institutions, we provided some moratorium for principal, you know, and kind of to delay, give them enough time to get more revenues to pay their loans so that they will remain financially viable. Additionally, we looked at the capacity of the MSMEs themselves, and we stepped up our capacity building program we did a lot of virtual capacity building for, for that period. We also did um, technical assistance for our PFIs. We started with a TA program for five um, PFIs during this period. And with the feedback from PFIs, it's really, really opened their eyes to a lot of things that they could do. Many of them have started doing cash flow lending as against the traditional secured lending that they were all used to. Think about the effect on gender, the women banking part of it. Many of our PFIs have developed women banking proposition based on the, the, the learning that they've gotten from this. Even on agricultural lending, because the, the management consultant that is also helping have put in a lot of things to assist them in, in, with all of this. So there's been, been, there's been a lot. And additionally to also encourage them and incentivize the PFIs to continue to lend to the MSMEs. We came up with some incentives. We developed an interest drawback framework that will help the PFIs to provide more funding to the MSMEs. When these are done successfully, we obviously will give you a rebate on the interest that you've paid. Let me not go into the, 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 the fact that we have a wholly owned subsidiary. Um, that has been mentioned already. Um, this has also helped to cap, uh, catalyze um, um, PFI lending to this space as well. So by and large, with all of this initiative and innovation that we put in place, my MD had already mentioned that from inception to date, we've done over 495 billion. But I can tell you during that COVID period alone, with all of this, we're able to do 190 billion to 30,000 MSMEs at this same period. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. This is a very So indeed, uh, I think, thank you very much, Bona. This is a very remarkable impact that uh, DBN has created despite the challenging operating environment. Uh, some of these measures you've mentioned, including you know, the moratorium, the capacity building, the TA to PFIs, as well as the interest drawback uh, framework. Uh, it's very interesting. I, I, I certainly would like to uh, come back to you and learn more about what is DBN's future plans on that. Uh, but now let's hear about what the other industry players are doing. 
Actually, uh, let's shift our conversation to Toying, who is joining us virtually. Uh, Toying, can you hear us all right? Yes, I can, Sophie. I can hear you, Sophie. Okay, we can't hear you. Uh, can you try to say something? You're muted. I am not muted. I can hear you. Oh, um, can someone help Toying uh, speak? Um, okay. Um, Perhaps while we are waiting for Toyn, we can um, we can turn to uh, Chizoma. So, <laughs> so I know that um, you know Axis Bank is one of the leading bank in Nigeria. So we are curious to learn what is Axis Bank doing in the MSME financing space. Thank you very much. Um, I think that having listened to those who have spoken before me, one would wonder what exactly will Access Bank be doing in the SME space, given all the challenges that have been mentioned here. But indeed, we're a bank that is very passionate about SMEs. And um, that has been the history for over, can I say maybe eight years? But then the only thing is that if your corporate strategy drives the fact that you must support SMEs, then I, I don't think that irrespective of whatever challenges that we may be facing, it will deter you from supporting SMEs. So let me just go back to the PWC survey of 2020. Um, that has determined the SME gap to be 650 billion. I think I'll, I can boldly say that Access Bank has been that 10% of that gap on a yearly basis because we disburse funds of over 65 billion every year to SMEs. However, um, ironically, last year we outdid ourselves because we this bust over a hundred billion in that space. And that's coming out of COVID. So one would wonder why and how did we do this? So while I speak, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know some of the things that we do. So like I said, it's, a, it's the strategy that is driven from the corporate level and we have very big support for it. So if there's a division that is set up in a bank to handle SMEs, and it's headed by an executive director. That will show you that we don't play lip service to supporting SMEs. But then our, our, our foundation on SMEs and everything that we do about SMEs built on access to market, access to finance, access to technology, and access to knowledge. Because I mean, we all always talk about access to finance. But then if you don't handle every other thing after finance, then you won't go back to finance. So that's what our learnings over the years have shown us. So if I take access to finance, we had, um, uh, when it was spoken about collateral and the fact that SMEs in this space don't necessarily have collateral. And this is what the banks shy away from because you can't, you don't want to learn when you're unsecured. But we've determined over the years that if we continue to do this, then we will not penetrate that market or make the impact that we intend to achieve in that market. So we developed the cash flow lending methodology, which he spoke about, but that was before DBA. So um, we started lending based on cash flows of um, our customers. And what, you, what we found was that you know, for, for these um, SMEs, even simple bookkeeping is a problem. They don't, they don't keep books. And many of their, most of their finances or payments don't even go through the bank channel. So even with the cash flow lending methodology that we developed, it was still very difficult to lend to SMEs, but we wanted to do it. And so we started teaching um, SMEs how to keep their books. This was very difficult because it meant that we had to deploy a lot of staff to customers' offices, looking at the books, teaching them how to maintain 
books, collecting their receipts, because this lending was very manual. But then we gained a lot of mileage because we started um, disbursing loans. And of course, decided that, okay, we'll take a, a maybe 10% NPL on this and then know that that is what we'll, we will um, lose out of this. So that did very well. But that cash flow lending methodology now did very well in 2021 because in 2020, we realized that it was becoming very cumbersome to do this manually. So we decided to digitalize it. So we digitalized that process and we started in 2020, but the results actually showed and played out in our books in 2021. That's why we saw that huge spike in lending for SMEs in um, 2021. And with the cash flow lending methodology, you can get up to 5 million Naira for 24 months um, under the cash flow lending um, process. Uh, initially, we started with the fact that you had to maintain an account with the bank. But then we realized that we were really not, we were not looking after a part of that uh, market that did not have accounts with the um, access bank. So then we amended this a bit to say, you know what, if you have an, uh, if you, if you're new to bank, we would use the cash flows with your um, existing bankers to lend that money. I'm not sure there are many banks that will do that, but we did it. And um, that also helped us to gain the mileage that we wanted. Because of course, for us to lend to you, you will now have to open an account, but then we will use your um, cash flow process from all the other banks that you, you have to lend you. Then we now design the instant business loan methodology. That also, you, would, um, you had access to 5 million Naira as well, but then you had to have an account with the bank. And then the tenor is shorter, is six months. So th those are the kind of financing um, methods we had deployed that had allowed us to see the growth that we wanted to achieve in this area. So moving away from finance, like I said, if you focus only on finance, you won't go back to it because there's no collateral. Recall that I said that these two lending uh, platforms don't have, I mean, you don't need collateral, but it's just based on your cash flow and your bookkeeping and, and all of that. So we, we decided that we, we have to do capacity building for our SMEs. So we have SME clinics. Initially, it was also manual. So we, once we lend to you, we now begin to engage you, teaching you accounting, um, bookkeeping, um, up to HR lectures. But then when we saw that COVID, of course, COVID helped us to do a lot more other things because we couldn't now sit down with these customers to talk to them about their books. So we had to start doing it um, virtually. And we now realize that this has actually impacted more for us and we've gained more um, access to a lot more customers than we were doing manually. Because of, of course, how many of us um, can you put on in the market to go and keep talking to customers? But our capacity building is very major and it's very critical in SME because if they don't know, they cannot act how you want. So we have an SME zone today where any of our customers can go in there and learn about any topic that we have put in there. So we, th we have things like accounting, we have HR, we have tax, um, tax trainings, we have so many trainings and it's available to all our SMEs. And so I can't even speak about access to finance without mentioning women, right? As we've heard here today, 65% of the SMEs are women. So we have a dedicated W team run by a very senior um, um, level staff of the bank. So we're very passionate about women. And that's where DBN comes in. You know that women also do not like to pay. And so interest rates from banks are very high. So DBN has really, really supported us here. So we have cheap from funding from um, DBN that we use for what we call our W loan. So 
our segment for women is called the W initiative. And so we give them these loans at lower interest rates than every other um, customer. And then the men will always say, why, why this um, um, disparity? But then women constitute more in the SME space and we have to support them. And even within the women, we have the W community, we have um, the W learning, W academy as well, where the women go there to learn. So moving on to that, I speak to access to market. We realize that many of the times, what also inhib inhibits SMEs is the fact that they don't know how to put their, their, their goods and services out there for people to see. So we created what we call the Central. It's an online platform where our customers can go and market their goods and services. Something else that, that we also did was we found out that during COVID, it was very um, difficult for customers to collect payments. So we started designing a platform where customers can collect their payments online, even with the USSD. And that was what now sparked the collections in those areas and dropped our NPL because we could now um, be certain of the collections. So access to technology is also really important when you, when you speak about SMEs. And another thing that we do is that, of course, everybody knows that many of these SMEs operate in their individual capacity because they're shying, shying away from banks. They don't want to also pay tax. So we partnered with the FIRS and started training these um, um, SMEs to understand why they actually need to now bring in their businesses into the financial space for growth. Because you cannot grow if you do not have a corporate account. And many, and of course, there are several examples that you can give an SME of customers who have started from the scratch and grown. So this was um, very, very, very um, good and interesting for us. So we did that and we gained a, a lot of um, mileage. So training is really, really very important. And we feel that for, for SMEs really, apart from access to finance, all the other, what we call beyond banking activities is really important. We help SMEs incorporate accounts because they don't even know the first thing about going to incorporate a business. So we, we have um, arrangements with different lawyers who help us speak to these SMEs. We bring them into the banking um, system, incorporate their accounts, and now make them financially viable to even sit down and have conversations about lending. So besides the cash flow lending and instant business loan um, products that we have, which are no collateral, non-collateral based. There are other loans that we have for asset finance. So if you want to be, uh, buy a, a car for your business, we can do that. Whatever equipment and all of that, of course the asset will be the um, collateral. So I, I think I need to stop there now. Thank you so much, Zoma. <laughs> because no. I can actually go on and on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we need a, a very holistic approach to approach the access to finance issues. You know, access, it's not only about access to finance, but also access to knowledge, access to technology, access to markets. So that is very well said. And we're also very glad to find out that the Access Bank is actually going beyond what a traditional bank could offer to create uh, more products to these MSMEs. And also, uh, you know, doing the capacity building, you actually spend time and resources in understanding their business, uh, why they need certain loan and how do we help them. So yeah, this is very well done. Thank you so much. I see that Toying is back online. Um, good morning, Toying. I hope you can hear us. Well, I'm going to try again. I can hear you. I hope you right. can. Yes, we can hear you right now. So, okay, great. So the Bank of uh, Industries growth platform is evolving to play a very important role in leveraging the technology uh, to achieve the access to finance in Nigeria. Could you share with us some of the key milestones that the growth platform has 
achieved in the recent years and how do you plan to bring the financial access to the next level? Um, thank you very much. Um, first of all, thank you for having me um, as a panelist at this conference. And, you know, thank you um, to, to, to um, the organizers and also very interesting discussion so far. I'm very pleased to hear um, all the um, all the interventions that has been happening with um, MSMEs, um, both from the wholesale side, which my friend um, Bona um, talked about, and also, um, of course, what Access Bank is doing. It's good to see that traditional financial institutions are also really um, foreign into this space. Um, even though the risk highlighted um, seems to be very, very um, acute, um, well, I hope that with um, the um, contribution I'm going to make now, it'll show that um, there's been some back-end work and maybe the risk is actually not as um, dire as, um, as it, it seems, it appears. So what is the growth platform? The growth platform um, is, is a platform, as, 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 it is, as it's called, end-to-end -end that um, was primarily developed um, to execute um, a social intervention program. But what has happened along the way is that we've now been able to develop or it has now become this um, really massive asset that um, has been able to unlock productivity um, at the micro level, at the SME level, small business level. So it's really been able to unlock productivity um, of MSMEs. Um, the growth platform also is, um, has become a tool that tackles financial inclusion um, and also entrepreneurship um, with the combined powers of, um, of, of, of smart technology um, you know, entrepreneurial flair and, of course, local talent um, and local sort of, you know, sort of pulling all of these different um, stakeholders together. It's been able to come up with what is the growth platform as at today. Now, in terms of what it has done, um, it has um, evolved to be to play a very important role in using technology to expand financial access. So. Um, so what we've seen that it's targeted in formal in businesses um, and, you know, um, I, I, the, the Access Bank talked about the fact that um, it's very difficult to bank MSMEs. And yes, um, the growth platform has helped to close the gap with businesses that do not have any digital record. And usually this is a prerequisite to get any form of finance. So if there's no knowledge, if there's no um, record, how do you, how can you access finance? So, and an institution cannot give credit or even a grant to businesses that they, do, that they do not know or that they cannot vet. So what we have done with the growth platform is to leverage technology to expand access. And some of the key things that, we, that the growth platform has done are, are as follows. Um, so for example, we have digitization or very simply put KYC. We have created um, over the last four, five years, four years, a network of over 22,000 active agents and we have called them human banks. And what we've done is we've equipped them with um, um, our own proprietary mobile technology and they've used this to capture data for micro, micro small and medium enterprises. And for every, in, every individual that we have vetted, we have more than 40 data points on each individual vetted. And so with these um, digital records from their business formation to the GPS coordinates, um, we do get to know these businesses. And so the KYC is established in a digital um, platform. And we're also able to understand their financial um, patterns. And also this also now all pulls together and we can now really understand um, you know, what their chance, chances of accessing funding or it gives them a higher chance to be able to access funding. Um, the growth platform has, has also been able to help um, really move the needle on financial inclusion. Um, as I said, we do have 22,000 agents all across um, the country, and that number is still increasing. And we have provided more than 350,000 bank accounts to first-time bank holders. So, um, you know, we've, these are actually numbers that 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 all unique um, account holders. So there are no double. It's not 350. That actually means 70,000. It's actually 350,000 new accounts. 
We've also created more than 1 million mobile wallets. Again, first time financial tools. So beyond um, bank accounts, there are also mobile wallets to informal businesses. And what we have done is that <clears throat> Um, we've used um, this information, you know, the, digi the digital bank of data we have on them. We've used all of this together to be able to um, create these accounts and also the mobile wallets. And these people have all received funds and they've been able to not only receive funds and open these accounts, but they've actually also used them. And we do have data to show that it's not just opening an account, but it's also using an account because that is what financial inclusion is about. Um, owning and also operating a financial um, account. What we've also been able to achieve is funding um, over the, the growth path platform has also been able to run several prog programs. Some of them have been mentioned today. The survival fund was mentioned by the keynote speaker and we've run more than seven programs to provide access to credit grants and capacity building to over 4 million MSMEs. And so we've used digitization, data capture, profiling, credit algorithms. And we've used this not only to understand the businesses, but also to make better decisions and to know who to fund and who not to fund and who will be sustainable in the long run. Um, we've all talked about women. Um, and so women and youth, of course, have been a major target. And we found out we, we I mean, just by virtue of the data we have, more than 50% of our targets are women. So that's just in terms of what the growth platform has been able to, to achieve. Now, in terms of the numbers, I've already sort of said some of them, but again, just, to, just very quickly, um, we have deployed over $470 million equivalent in form of capital. Um, today, we have reached more than 4 million beneficiaries. Um, of, this, of, of the 4 million reached, 2.4 million of them are actually Jeep, um, beneficiaries. Jeep is the Government Enterprise and Empowerment Program, which is the largest intervention program, I think, yet in Nigeria, probably in Africa. Um, and Jeep reached 2.4 million unique beneficiaries. And we have the data because it's all digitally um, um, collated. So we do have the data. Um, as I said, we've opened more than 350,000 um, bank accounts, first time users, and over 1 million mobile wallets, also first time. Um, accounts. In terms of the shift, um, at the time when we started, even at that time, Athena used to do their annual reports. And I remember one of the, attending one of the meetings, and then they showed us the, the you know, the map of, you know, how, um, you know, for financial inclusion and accounts that have been opened. And when it got to, I believe it was 20, I don't want to say 2017 or 2018, there was a very significant jump. And I think that is what this growth platform has been able to achieve. Um, finally, just to, to sort of close all of this um, together, um, we do we, we did recently launch a growth um, platform report, and that what that has done because you're now talking about what do we want to do, how do we want to take this to the next level. So the growth um, platform report it actually chronicles the journey of the of the growth platform, and it's a technical report really on what has been done, what has been achieved, and it does talk about the you know looking ahead. Um, again, the numbers are, are are very clear, and what we we we've seen with what we have done because this is actual data that we're using to drive financial inclusion, drive um, financial access, drive um, my um, um, access bank. The lady talked about. Um, access to capacity building, access to technology, access to markets. And we do have the data to drive all of this. And so because of what we have done, we see the next level as actually just scaling, you know, scaling, how do we reach even more people? And, uh, uh, and we, we feel that in the next, by 2025, we must have at least 25 million beneficiaries on the financial, on the growth platform. And how are we going to do this? We are going to do this through partnerships. So we do welcome, it's not a journey that the Bank of Ind Industry plans to do on its own. Um, the Bank of Industry is a government agency and therefore we do welcome partnerships with everybody, all the different stakeholders in this meeting today. Um, we, we do have the platform. It is a job creation platform. It does create all these agents, um, um, agencies through the human banks. Um, it also has the capacity to reach fine, um, to reach more people and therefore tick the box for financial um, inclusion. So 
financial inclusion and job creation all coming together um, enabled by technology and really, really moving that needle. And also we are geared to become I would like to say the largest fintech um, platform operating not only in, in, in Nigeria, but or at least coming out of Nigeria, but being able to serve even, you know, the Pan-African Pan -African market. So again, I guess the pitch I want to make here, since I have the floor now, is to say it's not a journey that we're going to do on, a, on our own. I think this is a very fantastic um, convening um, because this, this, this is an opportunity to really see how do we all come together, pull together, and really move the needle, because that's what we're trying to do here. How do we come together and make sure that we're driving inclusion, we're driving access, we're building capacity, and I'm making sure that we're, we're, we're working very, very hard to really get the drive the kind of numbers um, at the MSME sector. This is the most important sector in terms of economy, economy building, in terms of the GDP, we've talked about it, in terms of job creation, we've talked about it, in terms of gender, we've talked about it. And so I hope that at the end of these um, discussions, you know, we'll be able to really sort of tick up on some of these answers. Thank you very much. Thanks. That is the first time I have heard that. And uh, now I'm imagining they reaching out to, you know, all parts of Nigeria, the rural parts uh, to serve those who really need to open the account. Actually, uh, I personally visited the command center of uh, BOIG uh, yesterday and I was very struck by the, the, the amount uh, of the data and the level of details that this data uh, would provide. I imagine that, you know, in this uh, big data uh, environment, uh, these data will provide very precious um, uh, source uh, for further analysis and, and getting people included in the uh, financial system. Uh, let's now uh, turn to uh, Della. So, you know, both Toying and uh, Chizoma has mentioned earlier, you know, the, many of these MSMEs are operating in the informal sector uh, who don't necessarily have uh, uh, collateral, have saving accounts or having any data. Um, so as far, you know, these have prevented uh, the traditional banks from serving them. But as, as far as I know, the Branch International is a fintech uh, platform that actually can serve these MSMEs leveraging some financial intervention. So uh, could you uh, just let us know how do you do that and what kind of innovation do you use uh, to reach this group of people? Hi, uh, thank you. Can everybody hear me? Okay, cool. So um, thanks again. And, you know, very, very interesting um, work being done by everybody represented here. So it's very interesting to learn. Um, but at Branch, I think, you know, but I also think in forums like this, when you, a lot of the time when you speak about MSMEs, you know, our mind actually automatically goes to SMEs who tend to be registered businesses, um, operating in some kind of formalized or semi-formalized environment. Um, but the vast majority, and I think at last count, it was probably about 90% of the MSME um, segment actually sits in micro. And in the micro segment, there's very little separation between the individual and the business that they're running. Um, and these tend to base largely operate on on informal networks and you know, in physical goods and services. So this, I think in a large part automatically excludes them from a lot of the benefits available to registered businesses and available to you know, everywhere from the wholesale all the way down to the, to the retail banking end of things. And that's where an institution like Branch International comes into play. Um, the biggest, I think, uh, tool in our tool bag to be able to lend to um, individuals, micro and small loans to individuals is basically using an alternative form of credit scoring. Um, a lot of the things, even things all the way down to like cash flow uh, based lending still sits outside the realm or out of the reach of a lot of micro businesses. And so what branch does is basically leveraging machine learning and data to be able to build alternative scoring scoring methods for individuals. And you'll hear me talk a lot about individuals. Yes, we're retail and we lend to individuals, but from just engaging with our customers and you know, user feedback, we know that 
um, our system of lending is actually used by a large number of people as working capital for their businesses. As I said, there's very little separation between individuals and the businesses they run um, to basically you know, keep the lights on um, and, and feed themselves and their families. So that's what Branch does. So you know, we have, while we're very extremely compliant with both the Nigerian data protection regime and the global data protection regime, which is the uh, GDPR, which is what the EU uses. And we're very, very um, you know, circumspect with our customers' data. We do use some data we're able to access on users' devices, um, things like you know, your S SMS logs, um, the kind of device that you have, GPS data, that sort of thing, to be able to build a credit um, scoring profile for individuals. Um, and then we have what we call a loan ladder, which basically brings in first time borrowers at a certain level. And we use their repayment history to build credit scores for them. And then you know, those first time borrowers turn into repeat borrowers and move up the loan ladder um, with branch effectively. So that's what we do. Um, we've given out over in you know, about four years of existence, we've given out close to about 5 million loans to um, individuals in Nigeria at this point, that's you know, sort of discounting our global business. And we're just looking to grow that. And we know from user engagement that that's access to those kinds of loans um, for individuals who are unable to access formal loans from you know, commercial banks or even microfinance banks to some degree, um, you know, use, use our services. And I think pertaining to what we're discussing here, that's, that's the kind of impact that Branch has. Well, you so... Um... So we're really excited to hear, you know, all the alternative uh, products and the mechanisms that different institutions are using, the alternative credit scoring you mentioned, and the machine learning and the loan ladder. And certainly, you know, the people here, uh, audience here today would like to learn more about it. Um, so let's now hear from our development partners. Inga, so, you know, Nigeria Development Partner plays a very key role in supporting uh, the economic recovery efforts and also uh, focus on supporting MSMEs in order to uh, create jobs uh, and then, you know, uh, maximize economic diversification. Uh, so what is uh, the European Union doing in, in this space? I can be heard, yes, I guess so, yes. Um, yeah, good morning and thank you very much for uh, your invitation to the European Union and myself uh, to participate in this event. Already so much uh, interesting uh, information uh, and comments have been shared. So I don't want to go too much, especially into the whole rationale uh, of why we're here, why it makes sense and in short, if it's about the economy, it's about the private sector, if it's about the private sector, it's about the SMEs uh, as job creators, as growth creators. <clears throat> and I think this is also very much recognized by the uh, development uh, community. When you look, for example, at the sustainable development goals, what needs to be achieved uh, to, to reach the SDGs. I think it's common knowledge uh, these days that no donor funding or no uh, actually individual country uh, fiscal space is big enough um, to, to achieve what needs to be achieved. And, and here um, the private sector, the private capital, and the capital flows uh, in, in between are, are, are critical in, uh, in achieving what we aim for. So from the European Union perspective, uh, we are now actually in a very interesting moment because it's the beginning of our new financial uh, framework or perspective or, or budget, whatever you call it. Uh, these are seven year uh, periods. The current one uh, just started in 21 and it's running until uh, 27 uh, with the Nigerian government, with the local stakeholders, with the development partners. We have uh, established a number of priorities to work on uh, during uh, those uh, seven years and um, in the area of economy. And I think also, you know, when you look at the Nigeria, the, the development plan 21, 25, the 
what the World Bank was also saying, other interventions in terms of what other C priorities, I think we very much are talking about the same things. Uh, for the purposes of today, uh, today's discussion, let me just concentrate on those uh, that pertain strictly to the economic development. And this is actually our priority area number one. And uh, we refer to it as uh, green and digital economy. And that priority area, we are looking at three subsectors or sub areas. And number one is agriculture, climate smart agriculture. Number two is uh, renewable energy, energy efficiency, circular economy. And number three is innovation, digitalization, and jobs for youth. Now, going uh, back to the sub priority number one, uh, climate smart agriculture, just a few words of uh, how we want to approach this. I think you know, the, it's not that it's, it, it's actually a new focal sector for us in Nigeria, but it's not that we've not done anything in that sector previously. But I think the, the attitudes are changing from the more grassroots livelihoods uh, support <clears throat> to actually seeing agriculture as a, as a potentially uh, viable economic uh, sector that can uh, generate growth, employment, export potential value addition so uh, this is how we want to approach it and we want to very much work with the private sector and uh, what's already been mentioned uh, by others work on two sides so on the one hand side we recognize the need of some hand holding some transfer of knowledge know-how and experience to the private sector and we want to do more on that front so reaching out to agribusinesses uh, or their organizations and working with them and, and helping them get to the stage when they are bankable or investment ready. And on the other hand, we want to put in place, and we've started doing that already, um, instruments for increased uh, access to finance. Uh, there will be some of, of them that will actually be extra money, extra funding that uh, which is um, now, you know, not a so traditional form uh, <clears throat> of what is typically uh, expected of a donor organization that will be investment money that we want to come in, <clears throat> not directly uh, as the EU, we work through our partner financial institutions. Usually this will be the European development finance uh, institutions. <laughs> But we can actually invest directly uh, into projects. Um, other than that, I think very important, um, and this is uh, a growing line of, so to say, business on the EU side, are the guarantees. The guarantees that we again want to channel uh, through our uh, development partner uh, banks to financial institutions or to projects on the ground in the countries. So we also hope to obtain sort of a, a few levels of leveraging of capital al along the way. And then importantly for the projects on the ground for the financial institutions as much as necessary, the, the, the risking, the risk mitigation, whether it's a real or perceived risk, such as very often in the agricultural sector that is uh, traditionally bypassed uh, but many, by many financiers. Uh, luckily, as we heard from Access Bank, not all of them, and there are some incursions into that space uh, already. So we want to assist uh, the financing institutions and uh, project promoters in our partner countries uh, through that risk mitigation to, to do more and, and to grow their businesses. Now in the energy space, the, uh, the EU is already present for close to 15 years. And I think I won't uh, say too much if I say that uh, we really greatly contributed to, uh, to kickstarting the um, uh, off-grid solar energy market. Uh, we've put uh, quite some uh, grant money into that space, but now we're thinking, you see, the, as the market uh, is, is already sort of has started and there's more and more companies uh, in that space doing business uh, and they're growing, uh, perhaps uh, 
you know, there's not so much grant uh, from our side uh, needed as, as before. Uh, we'd like to also use other instruments, uh, more commercially based instruments, uh, but, you know, with the use of, the, of those guarantees that I mentioned or, or direct, uh, direct investments in certain projects. Um, also to diversify uh, sources of, uh, help Nigeria diversify renewable sources of energy into wind, hydro, and I think that, that, that there's also quite some potential uh, in, in that area. And again, while we work with the private sector companies uh, on the access to finance side, we are several times removed normally. So, you know, with those high level instruments that are to facilitate access to finance, we also want to, with our partners, put on the ground the, the support to the companies uh, themselves to build up and prepare that pipeline of, uh, of investable uh, projects. Now, maybe just uh, on that third area I mentioned, um, innovation, digitalization, and uh, jobs for youth, it's actually transversal. We, we want to see that and support that across the, across the board. But uh, also, you know, I think that was also mentioned, availability of uh, skills is, is an issue. Um, and, and here, uh, there are measures uh, as we work on, on development uh, um, of, of companies on the supply side of, uh, of jobs. We also need to work on the demand side of, of jobs, improving the employability uh skills uh, digital skills uh, that are that are sought by by entrepreneurs but also entrepreneurial skills for new startups uh, and innovations so i think i'll just uh, stop uh, here with this uh, short overview thank you thank you so much inga we are very glad to uh, to find out that the European Union is actually doing so much on the in the space of green and digital uh, technology as well as innovation. Um, we we look forward to working with you in that space going forward as different development partners uh, together with the private sectors. And also great to hear that you're actually starting to put direct investment in some of the projects and and the guarantee instruments, uh, which will certainly help uh, deepening the financing space here in Nigeria. So uh, with this, before we um, proceed to the round two of the panelists, I'd like to invite uh, my good colleague, uh, Dr. Marco Hernandez, who is a lead uh, economist at the World Bank based in Abuja. So Marco heads the uh, program on macroeconomic growth, trade and investment policy in Nigeria. So welcome, Dr. Hernandez. Thank you. Let me check. Good, good afternoon, colleagues, and thank you very much to all our distinguished speakers and panelists for their insights, ideas, their, their willingness to work under very uncertain conditions and support the growth uh, and job creation agenda, uh, which is essential to, to reduce poverty, which is our ultimate mission at the World Bank. Um, I wanted to, I've been listening to all the interesting points that have been highlighted. Uh, ranging from the interventions at the federal government level, what the subnational governments are also doing to support the growth of MEs, and also what the industry is doing and development partners. So I want to three points uh, as we as we move into the second part of of our of our panel. The first one is related to economic growth and 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 recovery. And it is undeniable the, the critical role that MSMEs play, not only in supporting economic growth, but also job creation and the agenda for economic diversification in Nigeria. But growth has been below potential since 2015 because of a series of shocks. But those shocks have been also made even more challenging, especially for those that make decisions on a day-by-day -day basis as a result of some policy factors, some of them which have been highlighting here today. So I wanted to touch on, on that role of the policy factors as well. But the critical point is that in 2021, the recovery was much faster than predicted, and that was very good news. However, that growth is still very fragile. There were sectors in the economy that were not recovering. 
there were companies that were suffering and struggling. And also the job market was very much more, uh, a, a much more challenging situation than, than before, not just on those that were able or not able to find jobs, but also those that were able to keep their jobs were seeing salaries going down and some of them switching from a full-time to a part-time basis. So that role in, in, in terms of the broader recovery and not only the speed, but also the sustainability of that recovery, it would be great to hear from our panelists much more on that front. The second point is that one of the reasons why growth is fragile is because of macroeconomic vulnerabilities that have become much more acute as a result of the COVID pandemic, what has happening with the downs and ups of oil prices, and also the war in Ukraine. So when oil prices rise, usually that means good news for the macroeconomic environment in Nigeria. However, in 2021, we saw that that was not necessarily the case. And one critical example is what happened in the fiscal situation. Fiscal revenues were down at a time when oil prices were going up. And that is contrary to what we have seen in the previous decades in Nigeria. That matters because that means both federal and subnational governments have more limited resources at a time when much more is needed to, to combat the pandemic, to make sure that the recovery is as sustainable as it can be. So that, th those sources of macro vulnerabilities take me to my third point, which is about the agenda uh, going forward, which I very much hope to, to continue to hear ideas on that front. I think uh, it is clear that progress has been achieved and we have seen uh, mentions to specific efforts and actions at the, at the government level in terms of policies that have been set up in place, not only to make sure that, that companies were able to, to survive the, the first uh, uh, several months of the pandemic, but how they can set foundations for the future, but also programs that were highlighted by development partners, by development institutions as well to make sure that that we have more systems in place to, to be prepared for what was to come. But also at the industry level and the role of technology, which I wanted to highlight, there have been several interventions on that, ranging from big data to essentially get more information about, about uh, companies that, especially those that are in the informal sector. But what, whether that progress has, has been there, um, what is critical is to make sure that that agenda is accelerated given the dire situation and the, and the uncertainty that the country is facing. Importantly, I think that there have been many mentions to the importance of ensuring a predictable system. We have um, a, a range of different factors that are affecting everyday decisions. And usually we say that, you know, when we don't have a predictable environment, maybe that makes or break the case for a large company to invest and create jobs. But for a small firm, that may be the situation between surviving or not surviving. Those that are making the decisions, whether that uncertainty is coming from whether firms are gonna be able to access foreign exchange and how much, whether they're gonna be able to have a good exchange of information with their peers or with uh, financing institutions. That uncertainty uh, affects day-to-day -day decisions. And I think that a lot of what we heard today is about making a system more predictable. And one important point is a big elephant in the room, which is the urgency to tackle inflation as one source of unpredictability. But more importantly, because in addition to affecting access to finance uh, in the country, it is also pushing millions of Nigerians into poverty. We estimated in our Nigeria development update of a few months ago that during 2020 and 2021 alone, only the price shock, so that increase as a result of inflation, pushed 8 million Nigerians into poverty, which is you know, larger than the size of, of many, many countries in the world. So it is critical to tackle inflation as a big elephant in the room. And, and, and one of the things that, that I know is it's a, it's a condition that was coming before the, the COVID pandemic and has made much more critical as a result. It will be uh, very interesting to know also how, how partners
industry is coping with these uncertainties, especially as we had a, a situation much higher prices and not just higher prices, but also a probable uh, scarcity of some products because of, of the war. So we at the bank are very much ready to continue to, to, to support in any way we can, not just with financing like Kathy was highlighting at the beginning, but also with knowledge and advice. And once again, we very much look forward to the second part of the panel. And thank you once again for those joining online and for those here today. Thank you so much for providing the macroeconomic uh, foundations as well as the relationship with uh, the financial industry. Yeah, indeed, you've mentioned a lot of uh, the issues that uh, the whole financial industry are also dealing with, uh, the instability on the macro side, the fragile growth, the challenging job markets, uh, in predictability, and last but not least, that big elephant in the room. This actually is relevant to uh, my follow-up question to our panelists here. For example, uh, Chizoma uh, in the you know the Nigeria banking industry has been operating in a very challenging environment. Uh, some of these described by uh, my colleague Marco. So this have must have uh, reflected on uh, the operational efficiency of the banks as well as uh, you know the risk appetite to some extent. Uh, you've mentioned that the bank, the Access Bank, has actually gone out of the way to do capacity building. You know, go beyond the traditional uh, banking business to reach out to some of these customers, and as and ha must have some impact uh, on your business. So, could you uh, let us know? You know, how Access Bank approach to uh, to approach these in in such a challenging times uh, and see the path forward. Okay, thank you. And um, Marco, when you were speaking, you know, I was just nodding to everything you were saying because it resonates with what we go through in the banking um, system, right? So let's take inflation and um, unemployment rates going up. You just mentioned that as a result of in inflation, 8 million Nigerians went into poverty. What happens to banks when there is inflation is that it reduces your ability to generate cheap funds, right? Because those people are the core of your current account base. So you don't have them, current and I mean, savings account base. So you don't have them anymore because they, there's an employment, the consumer purchasing power has become very low. And so that impacts um, the bank's ability to generate funds. And then on the um, SMEs themselves, it impacts their business. They are the worst hit when there's inflation because all of these things, their ability to absorb shocks during the time of inflation is very low. And so what happens is that during time of inflation, a bank who is also trying to keep NPL down, recall that regulatory wise, your NPL cannot be more than 5%. And when there's inflation, the SMEs become very high risk to lend to. And so you're not gonna want to put your um, funds into a business that you're not sure of repayment, that is very high risk, you're going to want to deploy it into a business that is low risk at that point in time. But what do banks like us do at this period? The solution is to go into partnerships because there's no way you're going to fund an SME at such a, a high rate and expect that the funds will be paid back because consumer purchasing power has gone low. And that's where DBN comes in, in situations like this, because we get funding from them at a lower cost, far um, below what we as banks can uh, avail to customers. And so we go into partnerships with organizations like DBN. For us, we're currently having conversations with FMO, IFC, so that we can have cheaper funding to avail to customers. 
And then of course, you know that there are central bank intervention funds that appeal to certain sectors in the economy. Those funds are single digit. Most banks don't want to do it because really it's not profitable. But what, what we do is that once there's an intervention fund that can help us with any segment of our SME, we, we're latching on it. It may not be very, very profitable at that time, but what we do is look at the long-term um, effects and impact on our customer, on our customers at that point in time, and what it will generate in future. You know, if you want to do the SME business, you need to have a bit of sentiment towards it. Because if it's all about profitability and the need to um, record very high um, profit levels, you're not going to do it. So there has to be a balance. A, ba a bank always has to find the balance between making money and supporting growth in SMEs to ensure that the, the economy um, develops. Another very critical challenge um, that has been mentioned during um, this presentation is regulatory challenges. And I don't think I would want to use the word challenge, but there are regulatory, um, there are regulations that impact our ability to fund SMEs. So he talked about Sierra, 27.5% of your um, deposits has to be frozen. That means that you have lower available funds to deploy to SMEs. Again, you're not going to want to do that in a high risk um, customer base. So that's where we have to begin to have risk sharing partners where we can share risk. Impact Guarantee, which is a subsidiary of, uh, of Development Bank does that. And we're having conversations with them. In fact, we have almost concluded on, on this. And um, there are other uh, developmental companies that we're talking to in this regard, because this is really what we need at times like this to make sure that you continue to fund SMEs. Otherwise, if we don't do that, then you're not going to be able to lend. You need to have access to cheaper funding. You need to be able to reach um, SMEs where they are at this point in time, which is why our agency banking is very strong. She talked about lending to, you know, when you talk about SMEs, everybody's thinking, okay, it's incorporated, structured companies. Many of them are individuals, like I mentioned earlier, who are doing businesses, but you can't really find them because they are unstructured. So we need partnerships that will make sure that we continue lending to SMEs. We recently did a, a partnership um, contribution sharing structure with Lagos State Government, where we availed over 2 billion naira to, to women entrepreneurs. And so we're looking at doing such things with many other state governments to help so that we can have a wider reach of these partners. So when you see, when you, when you look at Nigeria as a whole, you see that insecurity is also an issue. So that's one of the challenges as well. Taking a cue from what happened during COVID, right? Where many of the uh, um, customers could not repay, could not repay their facilities. And then the NSAS, which I'm sure everybody is, is well aware of, where a lot of the SMEs had their properties destroyed and they could not um, um, continue their businesses. What we did with the answers was we gave out loans, which we called all for one at zero interest rates. So I continue to emphasize on the fact that you, you really have to be very sentimental towards this segment of the business. We gave, that, we gave out zero loans because we needed to revive many of those um, businesses so they can come back into the system. And so when you revive them, you now begin to build, build them again. But having learned from that, we're beginning to teach our SMEs to say, you now have to create 
some level of um, buffer where you can have shock for some of these things. They don't do insurance. Many of them don't insure their assets. We've gone into a partnership with Coronation Insurance now where we're doing um, fire and special risk peril insurance for them at very discounted premium. And then as well, group life as well, because many of them also could not, even at that time, look after their staff. So where you have a group life insurance and then you have, um, you have fire and special peril insurance, I don't have to give you an all for one zero loan when you have issues. So we have to invest. We, we, con we continually have to invest in that segment for the survival of the segment and also growth. Because if we do not do that, then I don't know how we're going to you know, survive. I think that's what I need to say. Thank you so much, Shizoma. I think you, you help us understand the very importance of partnership. You know, um, you mentioned that as a banker, you, you, you're trying to make a balance of making money and helping these uh, SMEs. As a development partner on our side, we are trying to balance of, you know, the needs of these MSMEs and also the long-term sustainability of the fiscal budget. Um, but you, you, what you just said helps us understand where these uh, partnership come into play, whether it's DBN, whether it's the Lagos government, or whether it's some, uh, some yeah, FMO, some, some sort of, you know, even some, some interview prevention funds, where do they come into play to help create a long-term sustainability? So I think uh, this is very important. Some of the regulatory challenges you mentioned, including the loan to deposit ratio, cash reserve ratio, I'm sure at some point our panelists will come back to this uh, to, to discuss what should be the way forward. Um, but um, let, let's so know- Like I said, I don't like to see them as challenges because we need them right. to They're... regulate the industry. Mm -hmm. How, having said that, the banks have to work out a way to deal with it. Right, that's true. So we're not saying it should be stopped, mm -hmm. but we need to work out a way to deal with it. Yes. And that's the reason why you need partnerships to help you to deal with it. Right. Because this helps the The central bank has to protect the economy and they will do what they need to do to protect the economy in the interest of the, over, uh, of the nation. So that's why I said, I don't see it as a challenge, but it's just something that yes, it impacts you, but you have to find a way to deal with it, which yeah. is why partnerships come into play. Indeed, indeed. I'm glad that you're actually seeking partnership and we, we will for sure address to that point in a later stage. So now let's hear about, uh, you know, both uh, Dela and Toyin. Uh, both of you are operating in the non-banking uh, environment, but yet in the financial sector. So I would like to hear uh, what are the challenges you're facing, you know, in the fintechs or the growth platform? Are they... Perhaps we can stop employing. Okay. Um, can can you hear me? Oh. Okay. Um, because I couldn't hear your question very well, Sophie. I, I it, it was breaking, um, but I think I know. Just a follow up to. Um, I what? can just repeat quickly. Uh, so basically, we were talking about the challenges faced by the banking sector. And now we're turning to uh, if you have anything to add on in terms of the challenges, given that, you know, the growth platform is operating the non banking, but yet financial sector. So uh, if there's any more challenges you're facing, please uh, elaborate on that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So I, I think just so that I don't repeat a lot of the things that um, Chizoma already touched upon, I think the challenges are. Are, are, are you know they we're working in the same system the same space so we actually do face um, similar sets of challenges um, in terms of the degree of informality and you know difficulty in accessing um, these groups of people but I think you know just to flip it also to sort of make it a bit more practical and a bit more real and because I'm joining remotely I think I've cheated a little bit by reading some of the um, comments um, coming from the from, from some of the participants, is that how do we really make this um, real and what needs, you know, what, what are those changes? Um, you know, Chizoma said they were not challenges. So what do we need to do to really, um, to really, to really be able to do more? And, and, and um, the way I see it is that um, a lot of the things that I, I talked about on the growth platform has been more from the back end, more on the uh, making it happen. And so, um, sort of how do we make this more um, efficient 
Um, of course, there's still room because it's technology, it's changing all the time. And so in terms of the different, um, you know, creating the rails to really make this happen, we can always go in and, you know, look at what are the risk, um, you know, what, what are the, the partnerships, what are the things that we can adjust, how do we make it really um, reach more people, either through more um, efficient algorithms, more data, of course, and, you know, how do we address all of this? But I think the key thing really is, you know, beyond um, um, addressing those um, back end and efficiency challenges is to think about the ecosystem that we operate in. Um, and this is where I think we still need to have more of these conversations. I think the World Bank, um, through this report, um, which provides phenomenal information, but I think, again, how do you flip this to make it more practical? How does the World Bank help to really drive policy, um, you know, handhold, you know, our, our government have handled us, even us, to ensure that we have an ecosystem that is driving um, and, and supporting the growth of these um, MSMEs. At the end of the day, they all need access to, to funding, but that's not the only problem. Um, but the ecosystem has to be able to um, support that. So even when they get funding, there are other things that come to play as well. What's the infrastructure like? What are the policies um, supporting them and surrounding them? What are those things that will make them more efficient? So I think that's something that we need to see more conversations. We need to see more handholding, more partnerships between the World Bank, um, you know, Development Bank um, of Nigeria, even the Bank of Industry. We need to, to be driving these um, um, policy changes. And then funding, how do they get funded? Um, the truth is, if, if the funding is not well-priced, and, and I think Chizoma talked a lot about that. If it's expensive, if if the if the if it's not if it's just you know normal traditional type of funding, then it's going to be very expensive. So how again do we get um, how do we get the you know public to play a role in crowding in um, funding for MSMEs? Um, we we have the platform. The money can reach. Um, the, the, the MSMEs directly, the intermediation reduces once you are using technology to drive it. But then where do you get the funding from? How do you crowd in the funding? And I think there has to be conversation around this. These are what I would call um, the challenges that we face. Where does the funding come from? How do we crowd in to ensure that we can get well-priced funding to actually reach um, the beneficiaries? So this is the only kind of funding that will help to actually move the needle and that's when the beneficiaries on the other side will see that they are getting support when they're getting funding when it is more direct and when it when it is priced well for them to be able to actually grow their business and do what they need to do thank you thank you very much toyin and uh, thank you so much we heard you the need for funding is really important uh thank you also for alluding to uh, the the some of the questions on the online on, on the q a uh, we actually uh, running short of the time so we, we will need to speed up a bit with our next panelist uh so if you could please limit your answer to within two minutes that uh, we should allow enough time for some some of the q a mm -hmm. session um yeah so let's move on to Dela. is there anything else you would like to add in terms of the challenges uh first thing my name is dio d-a-y-o oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry sorry so I, I keep getting confused like we were yeah, speaking yeah. sorry to. about that yeah. not a problem um so i think um a lot of the, the same challenges we face um have have already been highlighted um the biggest one of course being inflation so the value of particularly when you're dealing with micro and small loans the value of um, your loan sizes, what they were, you know, six months ago, effectively are completely different from what they are today. So there's um, a sense in trying to keep up with making sure you're giving, you, you continue to give impactful loan sizes, but also keeping in mind delinquencies and the customer's ability to actually pay back. Um, and I think, um, you know, and uh, otherwise sort of like systematically, I'm also a huge, advocate which you know is telling in what i'm doing today for alternative means of you know pushing out credit to customers right um i think ease of use is probably if you interviewed um business owners even individuals in nigeria ease of use and ease of access to credit would be um something that's a particularly huge headache so for us it's just building our data and machine learning and algorithmic capacity to be able to continue to make good credit decisions quickly, but still remain easy for our users to be able to um, access their funding from us. So I think 
you know, data, things around identity, KYC, um, as a digital lender, as a digital player, I would say those are some of the biggest challenges that we face. Um, and, you know, just continuing to iterate around solving those problems ourselves as the system, um, you know, builds itself and grows enough to, to, to become helpful in that regard. Thank you so much, Dayo. Um, yeah, I'm hearing repeatedly some keywords such as KYC and data, and there's uh, no doubt that this is really important uh, to address the challenge. Bona, uh, what is DBN's uh, forward look for the near and medium term? Okay, um, thank you um, very much. So um, I think the, a lot of the issues that have been raised by my colleagues here, especially from the the ones that are operating directly. So I'm talking about Chizoma, Toei, and even Dio as well. It's, th those, those are part of the reason why we, we looked at having a wholesale lending structure. Part of the, the sales strategy we had when we were talking to the banks was that I'm not competing with you. I'm complementing your services. And that's really, really helped us. Because initially it was like, oh, um, you, know, you know, in Nigeria, um, most of us, we are very, very competitive. So when I come in and I say, I want us to collaborate to serve the MSMEs, it was more like, ah, you, are, you want to take my customers from me. So the idea was, no, 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 no. And I think that's really helped us to sell our mandate. So at DBN, Based on our mandate, we basically looked at different strategies. We have different initiatives that we want to use to drive this. And it's more around seven kind of key um, initiatives. So talking about funding, um, Chisoma made mention of funding, Toei made mention of funding. We want to see how we can expand our funding base. Thank you to the, to the World Bank and the other development partners that have been giving us money over time. We want to look at how we can also get more funds, especially around developing our green finance strategy. We think that is very, very important. It's key to us, especially in this kind of climate where we need a lot more of our MSMEs to start developing some green um, kind of um, um, strategies as well. So we are looking at concluding on, of, on all of that. A lot of people had mentioned the use of technology to ensure that they get to the last mile. So at DBN, we are, we've kind of rebank, revamped, sorry, and improved on our digitalization. We've done it such a, in a way that we realize that there's a cost that the PFIs carry when they spend a lot of time, money, resources to go meet the MSMEs. So we have a loan management platform that allows them get through to us and funds are disbursed to them. I can tell you, Within 36 hours, at a request, all those paper pushing and going, traveling to visit your development partner or to say, how do we get this money? It's all eliminated, it's totally eliminated. Within 36 hours, you get your funds available and you can disburse because you also have your digital platform at your own end for you to get to your customers as well. Additionally, when we look at people like um, Dio at Branch, we're in discussions with the central bank to see how we can create more channels for distribution, people like FinTech and all of that. But we're saying that why, because you know the CBN, they also are regulators, they are defined who the PFI must be. So we are saying why we get to that stage when we get them on board to accept to do this, we have created a finance to finance product offering that allows the people like Dio that cannot come to me directly to then come to me through the PFI. So that has been working very well. I can name a couple of uh, transactions that have gone very well like that. So there's the, and another thing we are looking at, we are revamping our TA. Remember I mentioned our technical assistance and capacity building uh, projects earlier on when I was discussing here. Now we want to see how we can cover most of our PFIs. We want to also cover the microfinance bank space. During COVID, we assisted our microfinance banks to develop a business continuity plan because there was a whole lot of things that went wrong at that time. And that assisted them a lot to keep their businesses afloat. And I can report to you that as at the end of last year, two of our microfinance banks, national microfinance banks, K1 
came, came back with the fact that for the very first time in their history, they crossed the 1 billion PBT gap because of all the assistance they got from the GBN. Those are the kind of stories we want to be telling. And that's why we're also increasing our advocacy. I know somebody talked about advocacy, talk about contribution to policies. Those are the kind of things that we are doing. We have our Office of the Chief Economist. If you go through our website, you see the, the working paper series that has contributed. We have our annual lecture series and stuff like that, where we try as much as possible to share our views and our vision to the development of the MSME segment in Nigeria. And I can assure you that those things are working very well. There's quite a lot in our development impact agenda as well. Most of our PFIs are focused on profit. But funny enough, people, people have started changing. Things have started changing. So we've been encouraging them to see how we can drive them to the areas of greatest impact that we want to have in DBN. Areas like the economically challenged states and gender, youth, startup, and all of that. So because of that, we are trying to create other channels like we have a consultant and now that is working with us on permanent capital vehicles, trying to find out how we can use that segment to drive um, access to finance for MSMEs as well. So to encourage our PFIs, Chizoma and Co, to go to lend to people in Meduguri and Bornu states and all of that, we have created an interest drawback framework. I mentioned that earlier. We also have service ambassadors. Chizoma did not mention that, but she has service ambassadors that she gave to us that come to us to understand what DBN is all about. And that has been able to help us push disbursement within the PFIs where, where she's operating as well. And that has training. really, and training and training capacity building of even the MSMEs and all of that. So there's quite a lot, but like you said, I should try and restrict myself for two minutes. So please let me restrain myself. If I get I carried away, thank you. Thank you so much, Bona. I think we, we would love to hear more about that, yeah. you know, you know, DBN's innovation in the green financing, in the digital, and also, you know, look out for different channels for distribution, the, the speed of uh, disbursement, the expansion to the MFB, as well as uh, uh, the permanent capital vehicle. I think the fact that uh, Chizoma and Dayo are here today means that you have made your point that this is not a competition but a partnership. <laughs> so with this uh, I would like to lastly hear from our development partners again uh, from both Inga and Ahmed. So hearing all these challenges uh, that are uh, shared earlier, uh, what do you think are the key reforms needed uh, in the MSME financing space and what do you think your institutions will do respectfully going forward? So Inga first and then Ahmed. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just want to use the opportunity to very quickly refer to what Zoma said about, uh, you know, bringing up FMO. FMO is the Dutch uh, Development Bank, you know, the bank of, of um, EU member state. And when I talked about EU guarantees, you know, it, you, you don't get to see it so much, but those guarantees are precisely channeled through those institutions. And I think this is the case uh, for uh, one of the recent operations, uh, allowing to again reach out to a group of um, uh, MSMEs affected by, by COVID. So th this is how we work, a little bit behind the scenes, but uh, I was glad you know, to, to hear the example of it here in the room directly. Now, um, I, I, want, I think you know, I will let... Um, the bankers uh, and the financial sector experts to talk about the specific reforms <clears throat> uh, in that space. What I wanted to mention are that I think uh, you alluded to that um, in your comments, the systemic aspects when it comes to the uh, MSME environment. If there's anything in the system, in the reg regulatory environment <clears throat> that affects or creates costs for businesses, it's always extra for, for the MSMEs. And, uh, and it's critical. And I think it's, there's a, you know, there's a school of thought when you look at uh, regulating uh, doing business in, in, such, in such a way that uh, uh, the, the rules and regulations governing uh, that space are crystal clear, are transparent, um, Laws are clearly written in plain English. 
uh, understandable so that you don't need a, a law degree to understand what is required of you, that there is a minimum administrative discretion, that there is minimum uh, administrative burden, uh, administrative cost. Uh, these are all very, very important um, for, for you know, the smaller you are, the, the bigger proportionally the cost on you and the burden. And, um, and also, you know, in, in, in uh, rulemaking, it's very important. It's, it's not easy, but it's very important to take as much as possible into account uh, the, the voices of, uh, of those companies and, and make sure that whatever you do, there's that impact assessment uh, on SMEs um, to, to really, you know, given the potential they, they carry, it's very important to, for the lawmakers to always keep that in mind that uh, uh, to, to, to always assess the, the potential impact that, that uh, can be felt uh, in, that, uh, in that category of, of companies and, uh, and, and harm them and uh, yes, prevent them um, from, from developing. So I just wanted to stress that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Inga. Ahmed. Thank you so much. Thanks for my colleagues. Um, I'll stick with two minutes because, because I think I think it's uh, it's I mean and it, it's unprecedented, challenging times, and uh, I don't I don't uh, I certainly do uh, uh, pity decision makers and policymakers at this time. But there are fundamentals that uh, we're trying just to highlight here, and I'll I'll, I'll, I'll respond to the to the question about uh, how are we engaging. Um, so again, um, it's, it's challenging times, and, and I think there are concepts that we need to observe and we can agree on while we move forward. So issues related to sustainability, resilience, and inclusivity. So that's, that's the pots where we're looking at. Just to, I'll, I'll start upstream and then and bring it down, particularly to our areas of focus, just to respond um, to some of the concerns about uh, what we have highlighted. Um, I think whether regulatory policies, whether broader macroeconomic policies, um, they are there to serve a particular purpose and objective. And the, the critical element there is the flexibility and adaptability to the, to the circumstance. So um, it's, it's, we're, not, we're, not, we're not asking or, or we're not contemplating reversal, but rather contemplating flexibility and adaptability because this is, I guess, the new normal that we'll be witnessing of successive shocks um, that faces the economy and then trickles down to the financial sector. So that's what I meant when I alluded to some growing areas of concerns, uh, particularly on, on, on the fiscal dominance versus the, 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 the CRR and in an environment where um, the inflation is rising, but the monetary policy is accommodating. So we cannot achieve everything at one go. I mean, we can, I mean the interest rates are, are slipping and then there's a pressure of the exchange rate and then at the same time, there's a fiscal expansion. So this all have to, uh, to go into a lens of prioritization and sequencing. And this is again, through the principles that I've mentioned, sustainability, resilience, and inclusivity. And I guess our, our NDU uh, for 2000, like November 2021 has detailed analysis on, on, these, on these aspects. Um, and, and, and trickling down to um, the MSME support, I guess we are engaging at various fronts through various instruments. Uh, so I guess our acting country director mentioned the, the development finance project uh, where we're uh, uh, collaborating and partnering with DBN on that. And there is uh, a, a more embracing of innovations, including, as, as Bona mentioned, engaging fintechs and uh, possibly engaging fintechs and possibly engaging other innovative ideas and uh, that would work for the, for the current circumstance. I think from what we're hearing is certainly that the banks um, are, are and, and, and again, from, from uh, what we have from uh, access bank is that the inflation is an ongoing concern to the banking community and to the banking sector. At the same time, we need to keep embracing MSMEs and support them. So one key uh, aspects of uh, 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 reacting to inflation is to look into ways and means to increase productivity as, as an exit to the spiral effect, along other other key macroeconomic policies that uh, uh, Mark might have alluded to. And, and that would happen uh, not necessarily through the financing, but I guess I'm very happy to hear what Bona mentioned about private capital mobilization, embracing equity-based financing, embracing instruments like risk sharing, risk pooling, and de-risking. So this is that like these unprecedented times that we're with, that, that we're witnessing right now is where I mean you mentioned partnerships. I would, I would go all the way into like naming it through risk sharing, risk transfer, 
um, through insurance. I'm happy to hear that there's bank insurance or insurance product that comes in. Building these layers and buffers that would embrace sustainability is really critical and thinking outside the box on the product offer. Um, very happy to hear about the leveraging technology and looking into how to, to uh, incorporate the big data and credit decisions. And that alludes also to what I was mentioning earlier about deepening the information and base to let the banks take the right decisions. Um, um, lastly, I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, conclude by that. Uh, I think as we look into sustainability and scalability, and at times like that, I think it's the is criticality is to um, go hand in hand again, particularly on MSME financing aside of the broader agenda or touched a bit on the on the on the macro finance space. But again, is a mix of equity based financing and debt for debt based financing. Debt based financing in the current environment is really challenging. It's equity based financing that would look into and leveraging leveraging technology and data that would look into areas related to uh, boosting productivity, that areas uh, through uh, harnessing opportunities sectors that are resilient and that are the conduits for growth, uh, maximizing value added and, uh, and value, value addition, domestic value addition as a mean uh, for the way forward. And we will continue to partner with DDN. We're open also for partners um, that, that we're having right now with, with the growth platform, possibly in SL NFD. So, but uh, through the work that we're doing now with DDN on, on, on the private capital, the permanent capital vehicles and equity based financing, we believe that this can be one way and one avenue to explore as we um, uh, are witnessing unprecedented risks uh, facing MSMEs and facing the financial sector. Uh, uh, back again to you, Sophie, and I hope I stick to my two minutes. Uh, <laughs> working with all of you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, thank you. You didn't have to rush. Uh, we, we, we would love to hear your substantial uh, remarks on, on the issues. So now let's hear from the audience. Uh, so give the time we have left. Uh, we uh, will only take two questions from the audience in the room and then two online questions. Uh, so for those in the room, if you have questions, please raise your hand. Uh, when I call you, someone will uh, give you the microphone and uh, then please uh, state your name and the institution you work for and to which panelist is your question addressed to. So we have this gentleman on the table too uh, with a pink shirt, please, uh, please. Um, it's afternoon now. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. My name is Dr. Loa Ogundupe. I work with NESA. Uh, so I have two questions, one for Chizoma and one for Dayo. Uh, so to Chizoma, she said about, she spoke about the platform for learning. So for the MSMEs, how do you ensure, because Nigeria is a peculiar country, how do you ensure that these people actually go to these platforms and learn um, all the modules that you have put in there for them? And my second question, which is directed to Dayo, but to everybody, is we want to know, um, what are the greatest risks that these MSMEs are faced with across board? So across all industries and sectors, what are the greatest risks? And are these risks insurable? Thank you. Okay. Um yeah, yeah, let's take one more question before you answer that. So I see there's actually more interest. Uh, I will take uh, because he's first, so the table two, and if we have more time after the online, we'll come back to you, okay? So please. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Ugu Ejimkonye is my name, from NASME, Nigerian Association of Small and Medium Enterprises. I want to, first of all, uh, commend DBN for this platform. And uh, my question goes to DBN too. Uh, I want to know what plan do people have for startups in terms of uh, equity financing or funding, as you may call it? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we will have take two more questions only. So this gentleman on table two, uh, yeah, who is standing up, please give the mic to him, yes. And then later, it's uh, this gentleman on table one, the, the one in the race. Okay. Uh... Thank you very much for the opportunity. My name is Yakubu Paiko. I work with uh, GIZ on the, a project called Nigeria Competitiveness Project that is focused on developing the value chain in agriculture and land manufacturing. So uh, I have just one question, but before I go that, to that, I think we have talked uh, very expansively about collaboration. Uh, we have also talked about how do we generate 
uh, low cost funding that can be lended to SMEs. So in the work we do, we also facilitate access to finance for our uh, beneficiaries. So all the challenges that have been mentioned today was recognized as one of the factors that does not allow for this facilitation. So we are collaborating with the Office of uh, the Vice President and of course the Impact Investing Foundation. By the way, the project is being funded from the Office of uh, Inga. So all the things that she has talked about is what we are doing. So we are trying to set up um, uh, a, a wholesale impact investing fund in Nigeria for the very first time that will aggregate this funding that will come to SMEs first at the cheaper rate. And of course, for the financial institutions also to participate on that uh, funding. We are looking at in the first year, uh, raising about um, 500 billion, which is about 0.2 uh, billion dollars. So we are also looking for a partnership that you can participate. We have developed the framework. The validation is uh, taking place next week. So we will extend our invitations uh, to you. Now, uh, coming back to my question, yeah. Um, the financial institutions, and I think from the presentation of Dr. Ahmed, you elaborated there one critical sector that can take Nigeria out of the level where we are today is agriculture. And you have clearly stated that 90% of this funding is coming from CBN and the intervention funds. And I see that the financial institutions have not mentioned anything about this agriculture, yeah? Because if we are talking about the sustainable uh, development goals, number one and two, which is about poverty reduction, and of course, zero hunger, it has to be agri. So why are the financial institutions shying away from participating in this huge, uh, uh, impactful economic sector of uh, the Nigerian economy? Thank you very much. Thank you. I assume this question is for Ahmed. So let's take one more question, one last one. Uh, please be precise due to the time. Frame. Thanks. Good afternoon. Let me first of all commend BBN World Bank for putting this event together. And by the way, beautiful contributions from the stage. Fantastic, congratulations. Uh, for me, I, my name is Linus Okore, the CEO of the Godney Leadership Center. Um, I, I listen intently in all the conversations. One critical thing that I know that I'm interested in capacity building, but I'm also interested in the context. What is the content in challenging times in Nigeria? Nigeria is very challenging place at the moment. Um, I, I like to see more investment in the leadership capital of the small and medium-sized business owners in this country. Um, what I mean is that investment in mind leadership, for instance, because if the challenges are too much, a lot of people give up and they never come back again. You know, you know, interesting things like teamwork, interesting things like envisioning process, little, little things that can activate the behaviors of these business owners. You know, if an, a huge investment can be in that type of content, you will realize that the type of growth you will, you will see will be unbelievable. And my experience is that a lot of people are giving up in businesses, several of them, based on my experiences with them, because of the investment is usually on technical. Most of the investment in content is technical and some other you know, key areas. I would like to see somebody reassure me that there'll be a lot of investment in those types of soft, soft type of you know, skills, you know, mindset, you know, leadership skills, skills that can inspire them to be able to build and sustain growth despite of the difficulties of the environment. That's my contribution. I like some assurance. Thank you. And who is your question addressed to? Anybody else? Okay. Okay. Let's. Okay. Who do you start? Is it you? The first question. No. 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 Let's. 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 Let's uh, deal with these questions uh, first. So over. Over to you, Chizoma. Okay. The first question was to me, and. Um, you talked about how, because of the learning platform that I had mentioned, you wanted to know how we ensure that the SMEs are actually training themselves. So recall that I said, we were doing this, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one initially, but we haven't totally stopped. 
but let me address that. We were doing it one-on-one, -on -one, so we had to have staff go around in clusters and train um, SMEs on different topics. When we introduced the, the online learning, that's the SME zone, was from the aftermath of COVID. So we realized that it was difficult for us to gather people together and put those platforms on. Now, how do we ensure? Just like we used to do it uh, when it was one-on-one, -on -one, because after every session, we will actually do a follow-up individually to ensure that everything that we have taught you, you have implemented in this. So there's always a follow-up session when they go, we, we can see who has gone in and who has done. And then on a monthly basis, we send out uh, reminders or on newsletters on different things that are going on in, in the economy and how you should go there to, to learn about it. And you're very correct that not every business owner will go. We also realized that one of the issues impeding them was also a lack of the platform or technology to go in there. So what we did is that we started also building those platforms. We had partnership with different um, experts and we engaged them in building the platforms for our um, MSME customers. So many of them did not have any idea of, I mean, what to do, go, how to go about technology at all. So we made those investments, albeit at um, in a like cheaper, cheaper um, funding mechanism with those experts. So we 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 continually, continually review the database of our customers to ensure that they are actually learning all of those things and ensuring that, because when they do, you will know from the way their businesses are structured. Now, we're very particular about segmentation. That was something I didn't mention in the beginning. So we segment all of them. There's the starter, the growing, and then the established. And so the, the ones for the starters are always more sensitive because they don't want to go there. They feel that I'm just starting, I don't, I don't need all of that. So the, the usage of that platform, you can actually see that is the starters that don't really go in there. One, one of the issues is that they don't have the platform. They are shy, technology shy. So those are the ones that we're focusing on. But the growing and established, they do go and we monitor it. We do monitor it because we will tell you. And it also has an impact on the next time you're coming to lend, lend um, to, I mean, coming for finance. It has an impact on it because we will see it. Thank you. Thank you, Chizoma. So the second gentleman that posed a question, I didn't capture uh, who is your question addressed to. Could you uh, clarify? Uh, to DVN, okay. Uh, okay, it's for you. Okay, yes. sounds good. Then you and then. Great. Because, um, what are the greatest risks that MSMEs are facing and are those risks insurable? Um, from my experience and from my user base experience, the greatest risk right now is the rising cost of production. And that goes with the rising cost of power, of the rising cost of, of labor, the rising cost of raw materials. And those three things, albeit all the same thing, the rising costs of the inputs of production are not insurable necessarily right now. So um, that's the short answer to your question. I'll, and I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, Bona. All right, thank you. Um, my friend from NASMI um, posed a question as to what we are doing about startups, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I'll provide some answers, but I also know that my colleague up here, Hakmed, is very passionate about um, how we will finance startups. So he's been smiling and looking at me. I'll also give him an opportunity to speak towards that. But specifically at, at FCM, as, um, um, DBN, what are we looking at? The, in terms of what we do with startups, we are looking at it from two angles. First and foremost is that we are OCA lending institution. 
So because we don't lend directly, we have to go through the PFIs. We have to then encourage them to lend to this segment. And so part of what we've done, we've kind of put in place some in incentives to push them towards that segment. But, but by and large, we also realize the fact that when we look at many of the PFIs at their credit policies, many of them will tell you in their credit policies that they are not allowed to lend to start up. They stated it very clearly. So that's number one is an issue. So we then said, okay, what else can we do? Can we look at areas where we're encouraging them and trying to find ways to incentivize them? Can we also look at, area, at other distribution ch uh, channels that would um, willing, that are more willing to look at the startups? And then that's why I said earlier, when I was speaking earlier, I mentioned of um, permanent capital vehicles, private um, equity providers and all of that, who are more in tune to financing startups. So we've kind of recruited the consultants and that's Epinos, look at it. And by the time we finish, we'll get back to the regulator and obtain approvals to deal with the startup. But I can assure you that as we speak currently, we are incentivizing the PFIs towards that um, segment. Thank you. Thank you, Bona. Over to you, Ahmed. So, so I guess I have a bunch of questions. So let me start from what Bona ended, then I'll, I'll, I'll address some of your questions on the agriculture and what we're doing there, and also the soft skills and building entrepreneurial capacity. I think they're all tied together. So let me just quickly, I, I think uh, looking at the landscape now and looking, as I mentioned, uh, um, in the recent note that we published in our Nigeria development update uh, for, for November, and then we, we, we plan to have uh, other subsequent follow-ups to that. Um, the, the, the ecosystem and where, where the economy from a macro perspective is heading and also uh, the challenges um, at, um, at, at, that's facing the financial uh, sector itself is, is only calling for us to embrace innovation, as I mentioned a minute ago, and, and I believe um, that um, deleveraging the MSMEs and entrepreneurs is really critical. And, and by that, I mean that we have to expand the equity base um, and, and the support to MSMEs in, the, in, 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 in whatever, whatever way we can uh, through innovations like permanent capital vehicles and through um, building Again, the information base for investors, particularly in the private equity space and angel investing space, to come in and 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 um, tap this untapped opportunity uh, in Nigeria. Nigeria has, uh, I mean, from my perspective, I, I think the entrepreneurial capacity in Nigeria is great. We see it a bit up top at the private equity level, but I think we need to go a bit down market where we uh, go for ideas, innovations um, that uh, that can. Uh, benefit from scaling up equity-based financing. And that's, as, as Bona mentioned, this is an area where uh, we're strongly and uh, committed to, and we're, we're uh, uh, engaging with DBN on, on the outcome of, of this market dimensioning uh, exercise. And then um, we'll hopefully look into ways into scale that up and operationalize it uh, in, the, in the near future. Um, and to, uh, back to the area of building, it, it, it ties actually is that equity-based financing would have to tie into building entrepreneurial capacity, right? Uh, to ensure that the, uh, the entrepreneurs that uh, that a, uh, a permanent capital vehicle would, would invest with would have the minimum minimum skills required uh, to uh, to be entrusted with an investment to move forward, and and that can be part of the uh, I would say vetting criteria for for entrepreneurs and, and, and projects that would be onboarded to such a vehicle. Uh, but again, I mean, I don't want to. Uh, jump the guns here until until we finalize the the current ongoing study and then take it to the next level so that we start we, we talk about uh, and when we talk we talk from authority and we talk based on on fundamentals but nevertheless the concept is there and the principle is there that uh, that this is something that we need to look at uh, especially if the if the if the banking sector um, and, and i guess a good starting point what bona mentioned is that we need to a good starting point is that we know that the financial institutions and banks are not equipped to finance startups. So this is something that we, I mean, neither from a regulatory perspective, risk-taking perspective, um, and also the expertise, the banks are equipped for a particular type of, of offering, and we cannot stretch them beyond that. And the level the level of, of risk that is entailed in equity-based financing goes beyond uh, the cash flow or, or, or working capital financing goes beyond that because the level of risk is a bit higher. Nevertheless, the reward also is higher. But, um, uh, but again, that, that's, that's what, what part of what we're looking at as part of the financial deepening uh, agenda exercise. On, on agriculture, I want to tell you that from the World Bank, we're not shy from getting the banking sector uh, to be part of financing the agriculture, uh, the agriculture sector. In fact, I'm grateful to DBN and to, to the leadership 
to the board and to the executive management. Um, uh, the World Bank, uh, hopefully fairly soon, uh, is, is looking into um, a life, uh, an engagement in the livestock space. Uh, and if we're talking across the value chains of the agriculture sector, I guess livestock is the most risky one. Uh, but we believe it has a huge potential in Nigeria as well for several, I mean, as you mentioned, for hunger, it addresses the hunger uh, SDG, it addresses also opportunities that Nigeria has to need to harness. But nevertheless, when you look there, I mean, adapting to that, this is where, again, the flexibility a minute ago I mentioned is needed. So, and, and, and this is also where DBNs coming in with an innovation to accommodate for the nature of this value chain. So you have, you have uh, producers, you have off-takers, you have a wide value chain. So how can you leverage the, at least the formal part of that value chain to off-take and to pull the hands of the informal and still yet to learn portion downstream of the value chain. So we're actually working um, at the midstream. So we're actually encouraging the off-takers to particularly work with the informal, um, with the informal uh, portion or segment of the value chain in the livestock sector, and and by doing that, we're building capacity of that informal informal uh, segment, and while building their capacity, hopefully preparing them to be bankable. So this it's a mix of cash flow based financing and a mix also of value chain financing and and coming in with an innovation, in in addition to capacity building, so that we start going down market and tap this untapped. Uh, uh, segment um, again but let me tell you that again while doing this we were cognizant of sustainability so we're doing this through risk adjusted pricing so um, um, and, and that was a challenge in order to start communicating this thought of sustainability uh, again due respect to, 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 to a single or a double the idea is not a single or a double digit the idea is the capacity the idea is the credit culture the idea is the repayment culture and then we can think about the pricing later because we can give as much single digit or double digit as we can, unless the, unless the project itself is, is viable, unless we have a credit culture to know that we're paying back, unless the project is able to generate multiples that can pay back the loan, whether it's a single or a double digit, the, the project will default. And I guess I don't want to get into details, but I think we're reading the press and news. So we are tackling this constructively. We're working on building entrepreneurial capacity in the most riskier segments in the agriculture sector. And, and we're working closely with DBN and the partnering banks that will engage in that. And hopefully by that, we give, we learn by doing so that we give also uh, uh, examples to others, uh, other financial intermediaries or a bit risk averse to start tapping these opportunities. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Uh, we've received two online questions, but I, I think one of them is already addressed uh, uh, by Chizoma earlier, but I will just read it out anyway. So it mentioned why our financial institutions hesitate to, to fund the MSMEs, but I, I do believe that we've discussed that when, uh, when Chizoma talked about some of the operating challenges in the banking sector. Uh, the last question we have is on, uh, on DBN. So uh, uh, one participant is asking, following on the entrepreneurship training, facilitated by DBN, they've noticed that the requirements made by the PFI referred by DBN were the same as the, that, the com, that of the commercial bank. So how does DBN promote access to finance? Over to you, Bona. Um, I guess that the requirements from both the PFI and DBN on MSMEs that um, <clears throat> require capacity building would definitely be the same, really because we are operating in the same environment and we basically look at the challenges that MSMEs are facing, which is clear since we're in Nigeria, everybody is facing the same challenges. And of course, we want to see how they are already coping with it and what part of um, skills would they want us to, or what, what kind of skill set are we gonna develop for them in, 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 in an attempt to improve on their uh, capacity building. What I cannot just say to add to what he is trying to get out or he or she is trying to get out is, before now we've been doing um, capacity building. Initially, was a bit more, um, let me say, physical, and then you find out that you don't capture quite a lot of people. So now that we've kind of blended it, we have a virtual part into it. We've had more partnership with some other organization and all of that. We are digitalizing it. Um, I think I made mention earlier that we have a learning management system that we're also building you know, into our uh, part of our digital offerings. We also have a business, what we call a one app that we call the MSME Business. All of that would then enable them to kind of on their own. So forget the what criteria we are asking for. 
on your own, determine what you want to be trained on. So by the time you go into this digital space, go there and then set up your own curriculum. And then you can then create more um, value for yourself if you feel that what you are being asked, the criteria that the banks and um, DBN is giving to you is not what you really, really want to, to, to do. And I think that's that's as much as I can give him in this stage. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Bona, for clarifying. So I think this panel has reinforced many key factors, uh, including uh, the need to develop new products, new markets, new technology, build partnership, uh, as well as you know, uh, go beyond the access to finance, but actually achieve access to knowledge, to technology, to innovation, uh, and to the markets. Uh, we've also uh, talked about the necessary upstream reforms to serve the local MSME context here in Nigeria. So on that note, a big thank you to the panelists for the conversations.